Good afternoon, everyone. I am Kim Mellon, co-director of the Wilton Historical Society. I'm going to spotlight, should I spotlight myself, Nick? Let's see here. Yes, why not? Okay. Um, uh, as I said, I'm Kim Mellon, co-director of the Wilton Historical Society, along with Allison Sanders, and I welcome you to Book for Lunch today. There are a couple of uh, requests we have before we get started. One is to please keep your audio setting on mute unless you're one of the speakers. Uh, and the other is um, to let you know that we're going to have a Q&A at the end of the session. And I encourage all of you to submit your questions via chat anytime during the talk. And I will field your questions at the end of the presentation. Um, now a little bit about Booked for Lunch. Uh, Booked for Lunch is one of the Wilton Historical Society's most popular programs. It is a nonfiction book group, which has met several times a year since the first meeting in 2014. While we've had many interesting reads and discussions, our group's interests often bring us back to the theme of unknown or underexplored women in history. The lives of the remarkable women subjects of the books we have read span from the Revolutionary War up to the 1960s. In Dear Abigail, the intimate lives and revolutionary ideas of Abigail Adams and her two remarkable sisters by Diane Jacobs, we empathized with three highly educated, well-read, opinionated sisters as we learned through their letters to one another how they grappled with being on the sidelines of the Revolu Revolutionary War and also with intellectual issues of the time. We also read Liar Temptress Soldier Spy by Karen Abbott about four undercover women during the Civil War, two from the North, two from the South, each of whom took courageous personal risks for the side they believed in. Before Me Too became a movement to be reckoned with, there were other untold stories of women standing up to sexist norms. We read Bringing Down the Colonel, a sex scandal of the Gilded Age and the quote unquote powerless women, woman who, on, who took on Washington by Patricia Miller. In this book, we met Madeline Pollard, an unlikely 19th century women's rights crusader who after an, having an affair with a prominent politician left her ruined, Pollard brought the man and the hypocrisy of Americans' control over women's sexuality to trial. And surprisingly, she won. To kick off the year-long celebration of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, we were delighted to have author Elaine Weiss join us for a discussion of her book, The Woman's Hour, The Great Fight to Win the Vote her meticulously researched nail-biting account of the lead up to the final hours of the fight for the 36th state, Tennessee, was full of twists, turns, and ultimately a culminating triumph of seven decades of activism. Women from across the country were suffragists, including here in Wilton, Wilton, Connecticut. In September of last year, the Historical Society opened its first fully online exhibition, Citizens at Last, Hannah Ambler, Grace Shank, and The Vote. The exhibition highlights grassroots efforts right here in Wilton by two women whose names are quite familiar to our residents. Please visit our website to view the ex exhibit and learn more about Wilton's first women voters. As I said earlier, we have read books about women from the Revolutionary War to the 1960s. Today's discussion of Yale Needs Women how the first group of girls rewrote the rules of an Ivy League giant brings us into the late 1960s. I am delighted to have Ann Gardner Perkins with us today, along with two of the first women students at Yale. Award-winning historian Ann Gardner Perkins is a Yale graduate herself, although not in the class of the first women. Uh, and at Yale, she won the Porter Prize in History and was elected the first woman editor-in-chief of the Yale Daily News. She is also a Rhodes Scholar and holds a PhD in higher education from UMass Boston and a master's degree from Harvard. A native of Baltimore, Anne now lives in Boston. Yale Needs Women is her first book and I for one enjoyed it immensely and look forward to reading her future endeavors. 
Please join me in welcoming Anne and her guests to Book for Lunch. I'm going to turn it over to you now, Anne. Thank you so much, Kim, and a warm welcome to all of you who are joining us today. We are in for a real treat because we have with us Shelley Fisher Fishkin and Connie Royster, who are going to talk with me after I give just sort of a brief overview of this history. I also spotted in the audience um, a number of the other first women uh, who broke that gender barrier at Yale. Particular shout out to Kit McClure, who's one of the five women like Connie, who's um, profiled uh, whose story sort of runs uh, through Yale Needs Women. I also saw um, Kay Hill and Mary Chitty who were with us last week. So a warm welcome to all of you. Uh, over the next hour, we're gonna explore together that point in our nation's history when America's most prestigious colleges, when Yale and its peers finally admitted their first women students. This is a national story, of course. Yale had long been a gateway to power with alumni that included US presidents and Supreme Court justices, eminent professors and doctors and lawyers, masters of industry. And finally, that gateway was open to women. But it's a particularly Connecticut story too. Yale, of course, has an oversized imprint in this, its home state. But um, of those first women students arrived, who came to Yale, no state except for New York had more of those first women students than did Connecticut. And so in September 1969, 62 Connecticut girls, including Shelley and Connie, arrived at Yale to break a gender barrier that was 268 years old. What happened next? Well, that's what we're gonna talk about. Um, and as we do so, I'd invite you to keep in mind two related questions. These are the questions that drew me to this research in the first place, and they're the questions that have really been brought to the fore nationally more recently by the Black Lives Matter movement and the Me Too movement. And the first question is, what brings about change to long-standing discrimination? And the second is, what stands in the way? So as I said, what we're going to do today is I'll start. I've got some historic slides for you to look at, uh, photos from the arrow as I give this brief overview of the context, both at Yale and in the nation in which these first women arrived. Uh, then Connie and Shelley are joining me for sort of a live interview. I'll ask them some questions, some of the same kinds of questions that I asked when, when I first started interviewing them for this book. And then it's over to all of you for your questions. If something comes to mind while we're talking, feel free just to type it right into the chat. Um, and I think Kim will start. Kim's going to take her questions from the chat. So, you know, type them in at, um, at any time. Sound okay? So let's begin. Um, and Kim, you can start the slides now. We're going to turn the clock back a little over 50 years to that time at Yale when women students weren't allowed, November 1967. And I'm gonna read a brief passage from the book to help you imagine what that was like. To picture Yale as it was at the time, imagine a village of men. From Monday through Friday, students attended their men-only classes ate meals in their men-only dining hall, took part in their men-only activities, and then retired to their men-only dorms. Yale admitted scatterings of women graduate and professional students back then, but Yale College, the heart of the university, remained staunchly all male. The ranks of faculty and administrators who ran the school were nearly all men as well. If you were to peek through the door at any department meeting, the professors seated around the table would invariably be white men in tweeds and casually expensive shoes, as one of Yale's rare black professors observed. Yale was an odd place then, at least to a modern eye, but since its founding in 1701, Yale had always been a place for men. If, uh, for you all who might recognize him, the guy on the left is the first president, George Bush. Uh, he was on the baseball team at Yale. It, Yale, of course, was not the only place that kept women out in 1968 America. The women's movement had barely begun, and discrimination against women was perfectly legal. 
in 1969, just 7% of U.S. doctors were women, just 3% of U.S. lawyers, just 2% of members of Congress. Yet, as Howard University Law School Dean Patricia Harris observed in 1972, the university turned out to be one of the most sexist institutions in the country. From the beginning, many of America's top colleges had made clear that women were not welcome. The world knows next to nothing about the mental capacities of the female sex. Stated yet Harvard President Charles Eliot uh, in uh, 1869, co-education was solely a symptom of financial weakness, he said. The colleges that could afford to turn down women's tuition, America's oldest and most prestigious, would continue to do so. Nearly a century later, Eliot's prediction held true, and in 1968, the list of U.S. colleges, oh, I'm sorry, that sort of jumbled, it looks great on, looked great on my screen before, uh, that still banned women undergraduates, read like an academic who's who. Yale's announcement that November that it was going co-ed and Princeton's a few months later finally ended the co-education taboo in America's top colleges. Yet if Yale President Kingman Brewster had had his way, Yale would never have admitted women at all. Yale saw its mission as producing a, a national leaders, a thousand male leaders to be exact. And because men are leaders and women are not, or so Yale reasoned, it wanted to give as few spaces as possible to women. Of course, if Kingman Brewster had wanted to see women leaders, all he needed to do was look out his office window, one block down at the Yale Law School, Hillary Rodham, future Secretary of State, uh, was beginning her studies, and then two blocks down at Yale Graduate School, uh, just nominate, yeah, just confirmed uh, Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, was studying economics, where she would get her PhD there. But because of the breathtaking insularity of Yale's leadership in this era, the fact that women could be leaders too was not something they could see. And just to point out how insular Yale's administration was, here's a list of King and Brewster's top appointees. Every single one of them, like him, had gone to an all-male, almost entirely all-white Yale, as had the 15 members of Yale's corporation, its board of trustees, every single one of whom was a white man who had graduated from Yale College, that village of men, in 1960, uh, uh, when, when co-education began. One thing they could see though, that was that Yale was losing an increasing number of students to colleges that had either women's students or a women's college on its campus, Harvard with Radcliffe or Brown with Pembroke, Pembroke College for Women. If Yale wanted to keep uh, attracting the top men, it was going to have to have women's students too. And so in 1969, it admitted them. Who were they? The New York Times called them super women, but many of them were just teenagers. This one looks particularly young to me. They came from all over the country, from Los Angeles and New York and New Jersey, from America's largest cities and some of its smallest towns. Some of them were wealthy with names you would recognize. Pillsbury, uh, Firestone Ford, Taft, uh, but others patched together their tuition from financial aid and summer jobs. Most of them were white, but 40 of those first women students were African American, 13 were Asian American, three were Latina. They were smart, they were tough. That's how Yale picked them. Girls who had three brothers, girls who had lived abroad, girls who had endured a hardship, Women athletes, those who Yale looked for that first year. I interviewed Sam Chauncey, who was one of the two administrators who chose that first group of women. And I'll never forget what he told me. There was no point in taking a timid woman and putting her in this environment because it could crush you. That's Carol Story, who went on to become a doctor, remember, at a time when only 7% of uh, doctors in the US were women. Sam Chauncey knew what he was talking about. Yale might have called itself co-ed, but because of a gender quota it put in place, women were just 13% of the student body that first year. As one of those women students wrote, 
When I raise my hand to speak in class, the guys turn to stare as if the furniture itself had offered an opinion. This token status was not the only challenge Yale's first women faced. They were spread out across Yale's campus, um, isolated in many ways so that each group of men could have its own small cluster of women. They had almost no older women who could serve as mentors of Yale's 407 tenured professors in 1969, just three were women. And while the phrase sexual harassment would not be coined for another two years, that did not mean it wasn't going on. But those first women were smart and they were tough. That's how Yale picked them. Within weeks of arriving at Yale, women students began organizing. White women founded the Yale Sisterhood, the first undergraduate women's group at Yale, and black women organized as part of the Black Student Alliance at Yale. Women organized their own sports teams when Yale refused to do so, their own singing groups when the men's groups turned them away. But activist groups were not the only force for change. The effectiveness of Yale's women activists increased markedly because of the support of the broad center of the student body who signed petitions and attended protests and joined the push for change. Activism by Yale's men's students was critical to pushing Yale to finally going co-ed in the first place. This is a replica of a poster that it, one of Yale's male students papered all over the campus in September 1968. Uh, that's his younger sister, Brooke, and Mr. Brewster, of course, was the president of Yale. Two months after the poster went up, Yale admitted its first women students. Yale's two women administrators, uh, Special Assistant Elva Wasserman and Assistant Dean Elizabeth Thomas, also used the tiny toehold they'd been given. Both of them were not hired until 1969, the year that first uh, group of women came. They were two out of, uh, the only two women out of 58 um, administrators at Yale, neither of them had a budget or staff to speak of, but nonetheless, they used those positions to advocate for women students. And over the first four years of coeducation, Yale's women students accomplished remarkable things. They started their own women's sports teams, despite Yale's policy that only men could play team sports. Yale women led the efforts to recruit and retain African-American students. They pushed Yale to offer a course on black women and courses on women's history and literature. They started an all women's rock band. That's Kit uh, with the sax, she's here with us today. Unheard of at the time. When thousands of protesters poured into New Haven in May 1970 and Connecticut's governor called in the National Guard, Yale women worked to ensure that the weekend did not become violent. That same weekend, they opened what is now one of the oldest women's centers in the nation. Yale women challenged Yale's practice of discriminating against women applicants through its gender quota. They joined the successful fight to end Connecticut's ban on abortion many months before Roe versus Wade was passed by the Supreme Court. They coined for the first time in this country the phrase sexual harassment. And by their very presence, raising their hands in class, titrating solutions in chem lab, outperforming the men academically in every single semester of the first four years of coeducation at Yale. Yale's first women students redefined what it meant to be a woman at Yale, and in so doing, changed the very nature of Yale itself. Thank you. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce two of those first women students, Shelley Fisher Fishkin and Connie Royster. And I've included photos of them as they were at Yale. That's Shelley and this is Connie. And um, Kim, if you can bring the real uh, Shelley and Connie on, that would be great. But let me, let me give you a bit of an introduction to each of them. Uh, Shelley graduated from Staples High School in Westport, Connecticut, so not far at all from, uh, from us in Wilton, and spent her first two years of college at Coeducational Swarthmore. In 1969, she transferred to Yale as a junior. And I should point out, of those first women undergraduates, a little under half started as uh, first-year students, what were called at the time freshmen. Uh, and then the other half came either as transfer students, either as sophomores like Connie or as uh, juniors like Shelley. For them, the possibility of going to Yale when they graduated from high school had not been there. 
At Yale, Shelley majored in English and focused her extracurricular activities on journalism at the Yale Daily News and as a stringer for the New York Times. She also played in the Yale Symphony and in the Ezra College, Ezra Styles College Jug Band. I didn't ask you what instrument you played, Shelley. <laughs> Upon graduation in 1971, Shelley continued at Yale as a graduate student, received her PhD in American Studies in 1977. She is currently a professor of English and Humanities at Stanford University, where she directs the American Studies program. And then Connie, Connie Royster grew up in New Haven, just a few miles from Yale. Her love of the arts, first cultivated by her boarding school, had grown deeper in her year as an exchange student in England and during her year at Wheaton College, which is here in Massachusetts, another uh, an all-women's college. Connie transferred to Yale as a sophomore and flourished there as actress, dancer, and community volunteer. After serving as an assistant U.S. attorney in New York and an associate at Paul Weiss, Connie was a founding and managing partner of a major minority and woman-owned New York law firm. In the 1990s, Connie moved into fundraising and ultimately became the director of development at Yale Divinity School. So thank you so much for joining us today, Connie and Shelley. And Connie, I thought I'd start our questions with you. You know, we all come to college as young men and women on the edge of adulthood, yet in many ways we carry with us um, the dreams of our families. I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit about why it was important to your family that you go to Yale. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Anne and uh, Wilton Historical Society and all my classmates who are here and new friends um, here. Um, it was very important um, to my family that I got into Yale. Um, it, w it wasn't so important that I go to Yale, but it, that I got in. Um, they didn't know I had applied <laughs> and I didn't uh, tell them anything until I was in. But once in, it was really a source of uh, extreme pride and um, very important. First of all, because education was the most important thing in my family. And secondly, because uh, my, my mother's family immigrated to New Haven, directly to New Haven from the teeny island of Nevis in the British West Indies at the beginning of the 1900s and immediately began working at Yale um, as cooks um, in the colleges and, and clubs and fraternities. There were no colleges back then, but the eating clubs, and then into the colleges um, as managers and maitre d's at the frat houses, et cetera. And so by the time I got to Yale in 1969, they'd all been workers at Yale. These are the men, of course, um, for over 50 years, so ha half a century already. And the idea that a daughter of one of the women of the family would ever um, cross the threshold uh, of Yale was far beyond anybody's conception. Um, and my grandfather, who was a chef at Skull and Bones, was, um, I was his favorite. <laughs> and he, uh, would really be so uh, thrilled at the prospect that his granddaughter was at Yale. Um, so I think, you know, the, the idea that, um, that I was there was really important and it, to a, a large extended family, which um, many others also immigrated to New Haven. So there was this very big sense of you know, one of the family had really more than made it um, at Yale. That's wonderful. Thank you, Connie. Do you think you would have told them if you hadn't gotten in that you had applied? That's a great question. I, I've <laughs> never thought about that. <laughs> uh, pro I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I um, do have a cousin who applied uh, last year. Who didn't get in and I was pretty annoyed about that. Yeah. So <laughs> Wow, that happens. I'm yeah. glad you got in. 
Um, so, Shelley, uh, why don't you, I, you know, as I said, the, the women's movement was just starting here. I remember one of the women I interviewed told me that she could remember the very first time she heard the word sexism. She was waiting in line for dinner at Silliman College at Yale, and that word, what, she'd never heard it before. And I'm wondering for you whether the women's movement was something a, you were aware of in your two years at Yale or feminism. And, and uh, if you could just t tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me and thank you to uh, Kim and the Wilton Historical Society. And it's great to see so many of my fellow first Yale women uh, on this call. Um, so I was not aware when I was at Yale of feminism as a set of questions and issues that women had been debating for over 100 years. And I actually didn't really become aware of the, the strength and significance of feminism as an intellectual um, set of issues um, until the 80s. And I remember asking uh, a friend of mine, the late great feminist theorist Lillian Robinson, why was I such a latecomer? Why was I so late discovering this? And she said, you had all the disadvantages of a first rate Yale education. <laughs> and, and she was absolutely right that that feminism bubbled to the surface at state schools way, way before it got to Yale. Um, and so, I mean, I had no female, fac I had one female faculty member, she was on loan from Albertus Magnus. Um, you know, I had no, uh, very, very few women appeared on syllabi. And the issues that feminism was beginning to grapple with just were not evident as intellectual uh, concepts in my Yale education. But we were living our feminism. It was a very hands-on education. Um, so, you know, I always felt that I could have made a fortune if I had a map of women's rooms on the campus, um, because it was usually a good bet to go into the bow bowels of the basement behind the boiler. Uh, but even then, you couldn't be sure. And this was a constant reminder that women were so insignificant to this institution that they didn't even have to, uh, you know, create facilities for their basic for their basic needs. Um, there weren't a lot of occasions when I felt directly, uh, you know, marginalized as a woman. Of course, I'd come from a co-ed school that had been co-educated for, you know, over 100 years, had been founded as a co-educational institution. And I didn't expect, I, I was very naive, I didn't expect it to be different. It was very different. Um, but there were a few memorable occasions when I personally realized, okay, this is, this is a pattern. This is not good. Um, as a reporter, as a stringer for the Times, I called the chairman of the board of Maury's and asked him, uh, why is it that women um, are full, full fledged students at Yale, but they still can't eat at Maury's? And he hung up on me. No one had ever hung up on me in all of my reporting. Um, or a, another occasion, um, I went to pick up the application to be a Carnegie teaching fellow from an English professor. And he glared at me. This was something I wanted to do after graduation. He glared at me and said, I think female fellows are an oxymoron, don't you? <laughs> and I was really uh, devastated by that. I decided why bother, you know, submitting the application, but bless him, Bart Giamatti was the master of my college. He was a friend, a strong supporter, and he ordered me to submit that application and said, don't you dare uh, think of not doing that. And I'm glad I took his advice because that's what I ended up doing after, after I graduated. Um, you know, another, another occasion, which again was more peripheral institutions than, than my own uh, fact, my own teachers or my own classmates. When I went with a, um, a law school friend to a his prep school reunion at the Yale Club in New York, we entered, uh, entered the club and um, someone in uniform came rushing up to me and saying, I'm sorry, you can't walk across the lobby. You have to walk around the edge, around the periphery, uh, which was a startling, <laughs> a startling thing to, uh, to happen. Um, but, you know, those are relatively few and far between. Um, what we found was, and I'm sure that, that all of the other women on this call found this, that we were daily, on a daily basis making history as the first woman to do X, the first woman to do Y. So I was uh, one of the first uh, women on the Yale Daily News. Uh, Dory Lesnick and I were elected to the board of the Yale Daily News that first year, our first year, our first fall. Um, you know, I was the first woman to uh, run the Chubb Fellowship, to run the Pointer Fellowship. And there are many, many things that all of us did where no one had ever done it before. Um, and so that was, you know, that was an adventure that taught us that, well, you know, it's possible to break into all of these areas that had not, uh, that had not had women uh, 
involved uh, in them before. Um, but I have to say, I did something that really puzzled me when I when I saw um, a flyer to audition for a Slavic women's chorus. I showed up, I auditioned, I joined the chorus. I had no idea why I had done that. And then later, it occurred to me that in order to be in a room full of women at Yale in 1969, I had to learn to sing in Bulgarian. <laughs> And you know, and it is true. There were it was so rare um, to have a, a spot, a place at Yale where you weren't in a minority as a woman. Th thank you, Shelley. Um, Connie, I I want to switch a little bit. I showed a picture of both Kingman Brewster and Elga Wasserman in the slides. Um, and and you actually had worked for Elga Wasserman when you were a, a student at Yale. Her actual title was special assistant to the president for the education of women, but it was the, it was a role we might have called Dean of Women. She was certainly the, the person who ran co-education at Yale. And I was wondering just if you could tell us a little bit about how you saw both Brewster when you were a student at Yale and how you saw um, Elva Wasserman and maybe whether those views changed after you graduated. Sure. Um, <laughs> I, um, I think that they were both heroes at the time. Um, I think Kingman, um, and we do call, you know, familiarly call him Kingman. Um, Kingman because he opened the doors. He, he got the university with the, with the uh, push and help of uh, the male students who came before us um, to get Yale to go co-ed. And so I think we, we felt that he had been a supporter. Um, and then he did stand up. He stood up uh, speaking some truth to power about the um, impossibility of um, uh, black people to get a fair trial in the United States, referencing the, um, the, the Black Panther trials that went on in New Haven during our first year. Um, and was extremely supportive of um, the community uh, and uh, the, the campus uh, and allowed us uh, to have a, a civic lesson, uh, best lesson that we could have in our first year by not having the campus fall apart that year. Um, so, you know, for me anyway, I think Kingman was, um, was a true leader uh, for us as a, as a college president. Um, Elga, on the other hand, was our real leader. Um, she was um, the, the most significant role model um, I certainly had. I think most of us thought that she was a superhero, um, if there is such a thing. Um, but she was uh, a superwoman, really. Um, she was known to go to bat for us um, collectively on any issue that had to do with uh, our health and well being, uh, our security, uh, whether it was, you know, uh, increasing the number of women. Um, to increasing the number of bathrooms. Um, and I think that we, um, we saw her as our advocate. Uh, I certainly did. I had the uh, honor of working for her um, as a, in the summer of, I guess, 1970 or 71, I can't remember which, um, uh, on, a, on a very big project having to do with um, preparing and finalizing a directory of all things women on the university campus. And um, it, it included the, the fine founding of the Women's Center, it included the founding of uh, a, a women's, history, women's major, um, and she could not have been more um, gracious, more thoughtful. Uh, she was really smart. And we didn't understand, I think, that she wasn't, uh, you know, 
a D. I mean, as far as we were concerned, she was the, the most senior person, woman, um, person though, uh, in administration. Um, as, as far as we were concerned, she was next to Kingman. And um, in that regard, she was the, the, the role model for us. She was the person, the go-to person. Um, and remained so uh, right through her passing. Um, she remained a, a, a friend, somebody you could reach out to if you, you know, had the uh, for to, fortune to do so, which I did do. And um, it was very sad, her passing. So. Yeah. I learned a lot from studying Elva Wasserman about how one creates power when one hasn't been given the typical tools of power. So she didn't have a staff, she barely had a budget, and yet she was an incredibly powerful force for change at, at Yale in, in what was a very difficult um, situation, one that of course eventually cost her her job. So Shelley, back to you. Um, so here's Yale. And for 268 years, every time a woman wanted to apply or even thought to apply, Yale said no. And then finally, it lets women in. So I'm wondering, um, for you personally, uh, you know, did it matter? How, how did going to Yale change your life afterwards? And particularly, perhaps, being in that first group of women? Um, it had a huge effect on everything I've done ever since, and particularly on, on the career uh, that I chose, everything I've written. And the effect was really this, which was that it taught me in a very visceral, basic way that paradigms exist to be challenged, traditions exist to be questioned. This institution for 20, 268 years had operated under a paradigm that said, it's okay to turn women down, to educate just men, to completely exclude women from this enterprise. We proved that it wasn't. And that gave me a taste for paradigm smashing, which has shaped absolutely everything I've done since. So uh, the first paradigm, major paradigm that I ended up uh, challenging, and, and again, I, was, I would follow where my, my research and my understanding led me, but it, it led to making some major changes in how uh, the fields that I were in understood what they were up to. Um, the first one was that there was a segregated history of American literature that people accepted. White writers came from white literary ancestors. Black writers came from black literary ancestors. Well, you know, my research in, in my second book uh, led me to find that um, none other than Mark Twain and none other than Huckleberry Finn, which was the book that changed all of American literature that came after, uh, was so indebted to black voices and black traditions that it couldn't have existed without it. And in fact, we had to rewrite all of American literary history because uh, black and white writers and speakers had been influencing each other from the start. Um, and that was, you know, it was controversial. It was challenging. It's now, I'm very glad to say, largely accepted. Um, but it was something that I don't think I would have had the courage to do uh, if I had not had that experience of challenging this 268-year-old tradition. Um, now, there were, were people at Yale who I didn't meet till, I was, till after I was undergraduate who were onto this. Uh, the great art historian, Robert Ferris Thompson, uh, said to be uh, white in America is to be very black. If you don't know how black you are, you don't know how American you are. And I hadn't met him and I hadn't uh, heard that when I was doing this research. But I, I was basically uh, finding that out myself and, and you know, challenging uh, the way my field had uh, had run, run itself uh, for its entire existence. The, then in the last uh, 15 years, I uh, became aware of the fact that people thought in my field of American studies that it was perfectly fine to do American studies just paying attention to writers based in America, to scholars based in America, uh, to scholars who wrote in English. And I realized that you can't tell an accurate story of American culture and history and society and, and literature without taking into account perspectives of uh, people outside the United States and that the global flow of cultures had shaped American culture from the start. And so, uh, you know, as, as president of the American Studies Association, I reoriented the organization to uh, include international scholars. I co-founded a journal, the Journal of Transnational American Studies that, that brings the scholarship into accessibility. So, you know, it's been really fun. Um, I've, uh, I, I had actually a wonderful time at Yale. You know, there were challenges. I didn't have some of the really dreadful challenges that some of the women in your book had to deal with. Um, I, I largely enjoyed it and it gave me a taste for breaking through 
uh, paradigms and traditions which stayed with me. Well, thank you. And, I, and as, as a, a Yale woman who came after all of you, my thanks to you because it was a lot easier for me um, than I think it ever was for you. And I don't, I did not have that awareness at the time, I'm, I'm ashamed to say. Connie, we've got time for maybe one quick question before we turn it over to the audience. And I thought maybe um, it'd be interesting to hear a little bit about your experience at the Yale Dramat. Because one of the things I found in my research is, you know, there's sort of, there's not a, a monolithic uh, uh, experience of women at Yale. It varied depending on what the backgrounds women came from, but also on subcultures at Yale. Some of the residential colleges were much, much more women friendly than other of the residential colleges. And some of the extracurricular activities were much more welcoming to women than other of the extracurricular groups. And uh, you spent a lot of your time in drama, both at the college, uh, residential college level and at the university level. And I, I'd love to hear a little bit about that. You're muted right now, Connie. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> um, I, I, would, I would like to start by saying that uh, as pr proud as my family was that I was at Yale, the one thing they were not going to put up with was me uh, having a career in the theater. <laughs> 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 um, but I've had a life of an advocate, advo uh, advocation in the theater um, or the arts, which I do attribute to both my um, high school, my, um, my time at Wheaton College, which I loved, and my time at Yale. Um, so I think there was a real uh, difference uh, in the experience of extracurricular activities in the arts. Um, because I think in general, the arts are a much more diverse and welcoming um, field uh, for women and, um, you know, as a place for difference. And I, um, again, was uh, very lucky that that was my passion and my extracurricular area. Um, the Yale Dramat, for those of you who may not know is the university's um, undergraduate theater um, extracurricular group. And um, they put on major main stage performances. And, you know, many people who've gone through the dramat have become uh, serious professional, uh, not just actors, but directors and tech, theater techs, et cetera. Um, but I was, um, an officer in the Dramat. Um, this was, the Dramat was a very welcoming place for women. Um, uh, I did act, I did some directing. I think there were other women who uh, also uh, played significant roles in the Dramat. That was not ever an issue. Um, it was perfectly welcoming. And um, some of my very best friends um, came out of uh, my experience with the dramat. And, uh, you know, sadly, maybe they are men. They were men um, because as we all know, those women on this call, we didn't know one another um, as women to get together closely uh, back then, because partly because we were so separated in separate colleges, um, and it's uh, only now, more recently, uh, in the last few years, many years perhaps, that we've gotten to know one another. So that most of my friends, my very close friends from my experience at Yale, were men. And most of them came from my experience with the Yale Dramat. So, um, but I think, you know, we, uh, Shelley has mentioned um, the Slavic chorus. Um, and um, I know Jan is on, the, on this uh, web webinar that um, she was also with the Slavic chorus and Kit made her way with the Yale um, marching band. And I think the, the arts was a place where women 
where where we just like made our way out of nowhere, and um, it was they were all areas to be very welcoming to us. So I think I, I'm very grateful that I had that opportunity to find my place uh, in the arts that led me to really have a passion uh, going forward in my life as a place for um, expression and a place to serve uh, on boards um, and uh, to, to chair boards um, in the arts that completely outside of my professional life. Well, I, I have to say, Connie, um, your family's uh, discouragement of your entering a dramatic, uh, dr uh, as a professional drama field is theater's loss. I was delighted when I was doing my research to find um, a review of a play that Connie had been in that was just glowing in the Yale Daily News about her performance the same year that they had, they sort of panned the performance of a of a, a young woman who was at the Yale Dramat that year, a woman by the name of Meryl Streep. So at least the Yale Daily News thought Connie uh, really had a future in drama. I, I should also point out that in drama, I think one of the advantages was um, that, that, that Yale had had women filling women graduate students, wives of male graduate students, uh, wives of male professors, playing in Yale um, performances because um, they had initially had men playing women's roles and they worried that would look too gay. And so they made a, a rule that if you were a man, you couldn't be uh, in a woman's role two plays in a row. And so they had to have women in those roles. And so that um, gave them some experience at least of working with women as equals. So Kim, I think it's time to go to you to sort of MC our, our any questions we have um, in the chat or however you're gonna get them from the audience or any questions you might have of, of uh, I would point you to, to Shelly and Connie in particular, but I'm happy to answer anything that um, uh, I, comes to me as well. Okay. Um... I haven't seen any questions in the chat. We do have one question from someone who'd like to speak. Um, so I think we can do that. Um, Jerry, if you want to unmute, you're welcome to and pose your question. Okay, thank you. I had actually typed something up, but I'm a Luddite when it comes to technology. So I don't know how to post the, uh, the chat. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm um, a uh, proud graduate of the last all-male class at Yale, um, and uh, also the la one of the last all-male classes at Hotchkiss, and an all-male Navy. So I am uh, very, very warped in, in how I was brought up. Um, I might, might also say that early on in life, I recognized that the, the, the women in my kindergarten and first grade class were smarter than all the guys. So, um, you know, it took colleges a long time to figure out that women should be there. And um, what I was just saying in the chat is th this the whole issue is, is really a very complex one for uh, Yale society as a whole. Um, there has been a lot of, lot of progress and I'm really proud that there has been um, in general, you know, society, schools, I'm glad Yale started it out. Um, the biggest concern when I was there was um, I was in the whiff and poofs and we had five guys who were gay and you could not come out when I was there. You just couldn't. And uh, uh, how sad for their college careers, you know, uh, you, most people on here may not know, but Yale's known as the gay ivy. Um, it's just reality, it's gone back, goes way, way back. Um, and so the, the, there have been changes that have been terrific um, over the years that are, are very positive for Yale. Sometimes it's, it's gone, in my estimation, a little bit over the top um, and I'll, I'll use as an example, the Whiffenpoofs, which is incredible pressure to have women join the Whiffenpoofs. And same thing with the Duke's men and all the other groups that were there. 
most of which have added women. And that's fine, it's worked out okay, but there is a, um, and this goes today for ch churches too, men's voices and music written for men's voices is different than music written for women and men together. It just is. Um, and the, 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 the one woman that came into the Whiff and Poofs a year ago blended fabulously. She really did. And my hat's off to her for coming in there. Um, but the whole movement of, well, we have to have it this way. Um, I scratch my head and say, you know, the shoulds of life concern me because there were plenty, I mean, the, the uh, uh, I forget the name of the, uh, the women rhythm, I guess, was the, uh, the women's group, very successful. And my understanding from the alumni as to why women had to be in it was because they felt they weren't getting the same economic opportunities that the Whiffen Poofs were in going all around the world. Jerry, I'm, I'm yeah. just seeing there's a number of other questions okay, and I I'm want sorry. to make sure we give, okay. um, give time anyway, to everyone I'm, I'm else. I'm pleased with the way things yeah. have happened. The, one, the biggest concern I have, I just had a daughter graduate, despite my advanced age, graduate in 15 and she loved it. Terrific situation. But what I see is a big negative now at Yale and most colleges is how they handle sexual abuse. Okay, um, I'm gonna. I I I do want to give other people a, a chance. Okay. But uh, thanks right, for joining Jerry. us. Um, and you know, and just quickly on that topic of sexual harassment, uh, and and sexual assault. I really. I didn't know when I started um, this research whether I would find evidence of that when uh, during this period at Yale, and I did, and and continue to have women tell me their stories and how isolated and shamed they felt about it. So, um, you know, the, the lack of support at that time was, was really quite egregious. I see two um, questions about me personally. I just want to take care of them really quickly. Um, one of them asks about um, what colleges I uh, wanted to apply to. So I was eight years behind um, uh, Connie and Shelley, and I will say, I applied to two colleges. I applied to Harvard and Yale. This shows you how arrogant I was, I guess, as a young woman. I got into both of them and I went to New Haven and I went to Boston and I, I grew up in Baltimore, but somehow Boston seemed big, Cambridge seemed big and overwhelming and Yale seemed a little more personal and my best friend from high school um, was also going there. So I went to Yale. I didn't apply anywhere else. Uh, and I, I applied to both of those because I felt like they were the best colleges and they had kept women out and I was going to go there. Uh, the other was, um, I was one of the, in the, one of the early years of Rhodes Scholars at um, Oxford and I didn't really um, feel, uh, you know, in my, and now looking back, every one of my professors there was male, but my best, best friend and my best friend to this day, I was actually speaking to her this, this morning, was a fellow woman um, history student. And so I think having that close, close friendship with Hazel, which has continued through my whole life, uh, really, made me not feel isolated and alone there. And I, I was older, so I really wasn't interested in extracurricular activities. I really wanted to study history, which is what I did. Um, so uh, Kim, uh, there's a more general question here, uh, and I would throw this to you, Connie and Shelley. Was there a reaction from the Yale community of parents and alumni that created tense atmosphere for you all as, as women students? Well, I'll start. Um, I think we knew that there were um, alums who were not happy about the fact that Yale had gone co-ed um, and that there, were, uh, there was a, a, a backlash about pushing the numbers of women up, um, but that, uh, and that, that we had some resentment about this uh, 1,000 Yale men business. But I don't, think that we were, at least I was not preoccupied by the, um, any kind of uh, 
you know, comment or what have you from alumni and parents uh, while we, while I was there, because I was there and I, that was my main goal was to be completely immersed in being a student um, at Yale and, you know, whatever they, whatever alumni and parents were doing was not my main concern. Shelley? Um, yeah, I, I would just say that Yale knew that it had a big problem with alumni, and for that reason, uh, they offered uh, a bunch of us a really interesting job during reunion weekend um, after our first year, which was to uh, show up and just basically have an all-expenses-paid weekend of hanging out and proving that we didn't have horns. And so I was assigned to William F. Buckley's class. And all I did was just sit around and talk to alumni and just, you know, have interesting conversations. And that was, that was evidently the point. And that was why they were paying me to show up and eat meals and, and just really demonstrate that we were, uh, we were human. Um, but I found that once, you know, alumni who might have been very opposed to having women at Yale uh, certainly uh, began to think differently when they met us. They, were, they weren't they were rude. They were, they were polite. I think they were surprised that we had something to say for ourselves. And it was actually a lot of fun. And as Sam Chauncey was quick to point out, many of those Yale alumni had daughters and were pleased as punch to get their daughters into Yale. Um, I mean, really what I found, because I was able to look at the letters that alumni had written to the Yale Corporation, is that the, the biggest um, discomfort with uh, Yale women from Yale alumni was actually some of the Yale alumni who were on Yale's faculty, who had sort of been at Yale ever since they were 18 years old and hadn't left an, an all-male environment, and then some of the men on, in Yale's administration who similarly um, uh, were not, you know, saw Yale as a, as a male place. So, um, I think that may it be it, Kim? Yeah, I don't see any more typed uh, questions in chat. Um, yeah. Let's see, maybe, um, yeah, um, so, I think this has been phenomenal. I'm so happy that the three of you are here with us. And I did have one, I was wondering between the eight years between your two classes, Anne and Shelley and Connie, how much changed in terms of um, like the isolation? Did they do start to, were you in a dorm, Anne, that you did not feel isolated in? Or was it, did it take even longer than that? So the, I think that was a huge difference in that by the time I got there, they had lifted the cap on women students and my class, the undergraduates were 40% women, which mm. is sort of a statistically the point where you don't feel like um, a minority. So for a white, straight, middle-class woman like me, it was um, fairly comfortable in terms of, of being a student there. Um, but I, I would say the the visible maleness came across in the faculty. So like Shelley, I, I had uh, my entire time there, I had one woman teacher who was a, who was a, a part-time brought in to teach writing in a um, college seminar, but almost all of the faculty were men. I worked to work for the Yale Daily News and spent my time interviewing men. And um, the leadership of Yale's core extracurricular activities did not, that's where you didn't see women until my, my year. Uh, and that was the, you know, the first head of the marching band who was a woman. Um, and the first head of the Yale political union was a woman. And the first um, editor in chief of the Yale Daily News who was a woman, that was all my class. But in terms of that isolation, we did not have to suffer through that. Um, one quick thing I'll say, um, if you're interested in stories of women groundbreakers and first women, I, um, in, in large part to amuse myself or give myself permission to do research that's not directly applicable to anything, I write a quarterly newsletter in which I write a story about um, a woman leader who people may not know about. And if you go to my website, the easiest way to do that is yaleneedswomen.com. You can look at some of the past newsletters or sign up this uh, issue stories about uh, the wonderful Polly Murray. 
So I would encourage you to, to do that if that interests you. So, so thank, thank you. you. So, oh, yeah. Can I just thank um, all of our first women classmates who are here and have been so supportive of um, everything that's, uh, in, that's happened in our various, your various book tours and have been just such a wonderful support, especially in our advancing age. <laughs> we, did, we didn't have it then, but we have it now. That's for that's sure. That's good. I did have one final question that came up on chat. Um, you three certainly are examples of women who contributed and have been successful. And that was a big fear I, that um, women wouldn't contribute as much as men once they graduated. At what point do you think they stopped thinking that women weren't going to be the leaders that the men were going to be? Or, or have they? <laughs> Well, I think part of that is a challenge as to what a leader is and, well, and what a leader is like. And point. there are many ways to lead besides being a U.S. senator or a wealthy businessman. So I think that would be my first challenge um, in, in looking at the incredibly rich lives these women have led, which maybe are not the typical man's life and help expand our view of what leadership is. Um, but, and you can then also point to the Janet Yellens and the Hillary Rodham Clintons if you need that kind of leader too. I, I don't know, Shelley, this is right up your field as an academic. Well, I, I should just say, and this isn't speaking as an academic, but it's just something that had never occurred to me when I was at Yale because I wasn't thinking this far ahead, but one of my contributions to Yale have been two Yale men. Um, I had two sons uh, who went to Yale. And uh, it didn't occur to me that, you know, that Yale women would be part of, uh, part of producing future Yale, Yale male leaders, but we are. <laughs> <laughs> and women leaders too. <laughs> Any thoughts on that final question, Connie? No, I think we, we have all contribu contributed in so many different ways um, and that uh, we are all leaders in our ways, so. Perfect. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us. And I encourage everybody who's been on this Book for Lunch to join us for the next one. We'll put you all on our Book for Lunch um, e-blast list. And with uh, the onset of COVID last year, we started having these Zoom meetings where we invite the author. And it makes it so much more interesting. And I think we're going to continue to do that even once we reopen whenever that will be. But uh, thank you, Anne, Shelley, Connie, from all of us. I mean, it's kind of awkward. No one can clap. <laughs> but we can <laughs> thank you. Well, thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Take Have care. Good afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Shelley.